Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today, members in person and those of us who are on the phone. Um, welcome to the September 28th uh, Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council meeting. Uh, this is a both in-person and WebEx meeting, so we do have some members and uh, audience members on the phone uh, with us today. Uh, please note that we are recording this session, so by participating, you're agreeing uh, to be recorded. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are a little light on DCNR participation. Uh, apologies for that, but we'll, we'll get into that explanation uh, in just a little bit. Uh, but I'm Gretchen Leslie. For those of you who don't know on the phone, all of the people in the room hopefully know me uh, after 10 plus years of being together. Um, it's good to see all of you today on this nice September uh, day. And um, just uh, a little housekeeping uh, for those of, uh, those of you who are on the phone, uh, council members, um, please feel free to uh, unmute yourselves and talk whenever you would like uh, and uh, turn your cameras on whenever you're talking. It would be good to see you. Uh, and, uh, and then when we get to the audience comment uh, period, we'll unmute those members of the audience who have public comment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gerilyn Singer. Thank you, Gretchen, and welcome, everyone. Again, I'm Gerilyn Singer, Chair of the Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council, and welcome. Glad everybody is here. We are a little light on some DCNR staff, but we have some exciting things happening that we will get to um, for sure. But again, as always, I'd like to thank the council members for coming today and and those that are with us virtually, thanks for driving and thanks for sitting around this table and sharing your insight and ideas with us throughout our meeting today. I greatly appreciate it. Also want to thank DC and our staff, Era and others, Gretchen, Katrina, who um, help us get these things rocking and rolling today. So appreciate, appreciate that. Um, and also our audience members that are here both in our room and, and virtually. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to be hearing about, like I said, some good things that Gretchen will be covering. But in addition with our agenda today, we have Nicole Faraguna who's going to be joining us virtually to provide us with an update on the solar siding and DCNR's utility scale solar guidance document that they've been working on for public land. So we're going to be hearing about that. Um, we also have Tom Ford joining us who is going to be providing an update on the trails program and some of the work of the Pennsylvania Trails Advisory Committee, so that we're glad to have you here with us as well. But at this time, I'd like to ask that we go around our table here and introduce our council members and then we'll turn over to our ones that are joining us virtually. Dave, could you get us started? Uh, Dave Trimpey, I'm from Warren County, council member. Bob Kirshner, I'm uh, from Elk County and uh, Vice Chair. Rocco Alley, I'm from Armstrong County. Matt Gobbler, currently residing in Cumberland County. Meredith Graham from Washington County, I'm the Council Secretary. Sarah Hall Bagdonis from Wayne County. And then I believe joining us we have um, Ted, are you there? make sure we can hear yes, you. I'm here. I'm here. Would, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Ted Farron from Marion County. Okay. And also, Steve, are you joining us as well? Yes. Steve Stroman from Lancaster County. Okay. And Greg? Greg Goldman from Philadelphia County. Okay. Welcome. And I'm not sure if Joanne is on yet or not. Joanne, are you with us? Okay, not yet. She might be joining us a little later. So, so welcome, council members. I also at this time would like to just go to our audience. Um, if you could introduce yourself. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up for our first public comment period on our agenda. As you all know, we off have two offerings of public comment. One that is now that's somewhat non-agenda related, welcoming comments from 
folks that would like to share something with us. And then again, in uh, following our presentations that are more presentation related, we have a public comment period. And at this time, we do have um, someone that is interested in joining us, and that is Barb Jamoska. Hopefully I'm saying that right, Barb. And she is with the Friends to Save the Loyal Sock Creek, and she's asked to provide an update with us with some things that are going on in her area. Barb, are you there? I am. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. We can hear you. Okay, terrific. Let me know if that volume needs to be adjusted. I'm getting some feedback on my end. Um, I just wanted to bring to the attention of, of the group and, and thank you, first of all, for your service to this to this committee and for all that you do to help to make Pennsylvania uh, a safer, better place to live. So I do appreciate your work and all that you're doing. Um, I live in Lycoming County. Uh, Jerry Walls, I believe, is a member of CONRAP, but I don't see that Jerry's there today. Am I, am I right? You are right. I believe Jerry is in Africa. Um, oh, my. He's had a long time planning of that trip, but yes, otherwise he is normally here. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, I can certainly share this with him. I know Jerry well, I've known him for a long time, he and his wife, Joy, I didn't know that they were in Africa, so good for them. But in any event, what is happening here in the Loyal Sox State Forest, which is directly and immediately adjacent to my property? I live on 20 acres that, that borders the Loyal Sox Creek and the Loyal Sox State Forest. And uh, Pennsylvania General Energy, PGE, has a massive gas development project underway here. It involves, um, by the time it is finished, um, a water withdrawal from the Loyal Sock Creek, which is the fourth one on this EV Creek that has been permitted by SRBC. And um, the build out that includes up to 80 fracked gas wells on both sides of the creek um, in the Loyal Sock State Forest in, in Lycoming County. The local group that I'm a part of, um, we call ourselves Friends of the Creek. We organized under the banner of the Responsible Decarbonization Alliance. Um, we have been in frequent meetings and communication with DCNR over the past four years, um, trying to advocate for the creek and for the Loyal Sox State Forest and to get answers to the many questions that we have. And my hope today is that this group might be able to help us with DCNR um, to get answers to two open-ended questions that remain. And one of these involves the use of Butternut Grove Road and the other one involves the pipeline itself. And I'll just back up by saying that construction on this project began in July. It began in the creek itself with the construction of the water withdrawal. If any of you follow the uh, digest that is published by former DEP Secretary David Hess, David has featured uh, at least three articles thus far on this project that he devoted exclusively to it. Um, there have been uh, to date nine violations of the Clean Streams Act in the Loyal Sock Creek here as it intersects the Loyal Sock State Forest. Um, and it has been a devastating thing to watch what's happening to the creek. Um, Peter Petrokas, the hellbender ex uh, uh, expert here who teaches at Lycoming College has weighed in and said that two hellbender uh, habitats have been destroyed by the gas activity. And um, it's, it's just been uh, something of an ongoing nightmare for us to watch. Uh, to date, as I said, there's been uh, nine NOVs issued by DEP, but uh, as of right now, none of those have carried a fine. But I know I only have five minutes. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sorry that I have five minutes, but I'm sorry to ramble a bit. I'm going to try to stick with that to share with you now the two concerns that we have one being the gas company's use of Butternut Grove Road. There's no way that I can share my screen with you, can I? To, to have you see a picture that's on my computer screen? No, unfortunately, I'm being told by our 
technical folks here that that cannot happen at this point. Okay, um, no problem. I had some pictures ready so you could see what I was talking about, but we have been told two things verbally by DCNR in our four year ongoing conversation with them, trying to protect our homes, our neighborhood, um, the state forest and the creek. And we have gotten verbal uh, answers only. And we have asked DCNR to put those two, I'm going to call them promises in writing, but they have thus far refused to do so. We went so far as to hire an attorney and file right to know requests with the agency and with Governor Wolf's office to try to find out if there are things that we were not otherwise privy to conversations and agreements to try to figure out what's going on. And for the most part, um, those uh, those requests were denied and that information was noted as pre-decisional privileged information. So even using an attorney to try to find out answers to these questions, we have failed. So our questions are one, Arian Proctor stated um, publicly and verbally at a meeting that we had there in the Rachel Carson building with DCNR that, that PGE, the gas company, would not be allowed to access the mountaintop by using Butternut Grove Road, which is basically a one lane, no outlet, country road, um, steep, because it climbs the mountain. Um, and there are about 25 families living on this road. Um, it is extremely dangerous when the gas company uses the road. We know that because of the wells that are already existing. We we have a verbal guarantee, but so far, um, no, no written guarantee. And to date, the gas company is already using Butternut Grove Road. So we'd like to know what's going to happen with that going forward, because they're there is supposed to be a total of 80 wells. And the other thing that has happened is um, DCNR, to their credit, is requiring PGE to run the gas gathering line that they want to run down two steep mountain, down, down and back up the two steep mountain slopes in the Loyal Sox State Forest on either side of the Loyal Sox Creek because um, PGE wants to connect the wells on the mountaintop to the south, which is the Allegheny Ridge, to the mountaintop on the north, which is Jacoby Mountain. And in order to do that, to get the gas out, they want to run this rim-to-rim -rim gathering gas line. And DCNR said, gave them permission to do it. It has to go down the slopes, uh, very steep slopes that are about two miles long under the highway, under the creek, and, and connect these wells. Our question to DCNR is, what happens if the geology of this area fails that plan and the pipeline cannot be installed? This is new technology. It's never been done, as we understand from DCNR. It's never been done before in Pennsylvania. It's never been done before in this particular um, often sandy and cobbly uh, geology. So our question is, what happens if they try and fail to run this pipeline? Are we then going to get uh, clear-cut right-of-ways on the steep slopes of the Loyal Sock Forest in an area that has already had, uh, a couple of years ago, four landslides on these steep slopes where massive volumes of trees and mud and rock came um, crashing down the mountain and closed roads and landed in the Loyal Sock Creek. Um, it's a very unstable area. And so we are deeply concerned about a lot of things, but these two questions are open-ended and still hanging open. And so I am here on behalf of Friends of the Sock to plead with Conrack to see if you folks have um, any way to get answers from DCNR that we have not been able to get in spite of, as I said, ongoing uh, four years of conversation. And I will close with this. In order to get this story out, um, because it is very complex and convoluted, we did build a website. And I'm going to give you that URL and just invite all of you to visit that website. And it is www.keepitwildpa.org. 
www.keepitwildpa.org. And there's a video um, that shows this beautiful section of the creek. There's um, some of the neighbors talking about what it's like to live beside this project. And most importantly, there's a narrative um, that tells the ongoing uh, four-year story of what we have been doing with our local, uh, with our county commissioners, with our township supervisors and with DCNR and DEP um, to try to get the best possible outcome for this. I will add that that uh, the county commissioners, two Republicans and one Democrat here in Lycoming County wrote a letter, a unanimous letter um, to DCNR asking them to please not permit this project. Um, that that request was did not was not honored. So I will close with that. Again, my um, my thanks to all of you for the work that you're doing, and I hope you can uh, take a look at this uh, beautiful little section of our state in the Los Angeles State Forest and perhaps lend us a hand. Thank you. If you are, Barb, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, I think that was on our end. We apologize. Uh, we somehow got disconnected from everyone. Let me just check in. Greg and Steve and Ted, can you hear us? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, so we continued our discussion. Let me just try to summarize that quickly. Um, Barb, we know this has been going on for a number of years. We as council will be discussing this in our afternoon session today. Um, and we would, are the pictures that you have on the website, one of our council members was just asking if the pictures could be made available. 
Um, they certainly can be, but they are not on the website. It's a real bare bones website. It has the video that we made, the narrative that I, that I wrote that tells the story. And I believe at this point, two, um, uh, cop two links to David Hess's digest when he featured this area in it. Yeah. There's now, he's now done that a couple other times. We're, we're just, we have no money. We, you know, we've paid an attorney. Um, so even, uh, and none of us have any web skills, but I, these are pictures that I have in my files. Um, I'd be happy to send them to one of you and you can yeah. share them. If you, if you wouldn't mind sending them to Katrina, who you have been relating with and getting, uh, this presentation this morning, getting uh, your comments heard. So if you could share them with Katrina, then she can make sure that we get them as well. I would um, be ha very happy to do that, yes. Okay, okay, and thank you very much. We do appreciate you coming on this morning and we do appreciate the commitment that you have made and have been a part of for a number of years with the Loyal Talk Friends. So thank you very much and we will be reviewing this in this afternoon session. Oh, great to hear. Thank you for your work and carry on. Um, keep making, keep making Pennsylvania a good place to live. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Barb. Okay. Uh, with that, we're going to get back to our agenda and the approval of our July minutes, our July 27th meeting. Everyone from council should have received those. And at this point, I would just ask for a motion to accept the minutes of the July 27th meeting. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Sarah. Second? Second. Dave seconded. Is there anyone opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And on to our council report. There are a few items that I have this morning just wanting to share with council members and everyone. Um, we are happy to say our annual report is completed and available on our website. Thank you, Katrina, <laughs> for your hard work. And I know, Gretchen, you helped uh, facilitate that coming together. So if you are interested in looking at it, it is available on our CONRAC website, which is part of the DCNR website. Um, also, one thing I did want to mention is that we were scheduled to have a CONRAC conversations this time in the fall. And given the election and all of the things going on, we decided that it would probably be best to table it and hold off until the new year. So we were thinking maybe sometime of a February timeframe to have our next CONRAC conversations. And as council members, we will be discussing this briefly in our, in our afternoon session today to get more input from you on um, how to proceed. And also, I just wanted to share too that our council members have been out and about for sure <laughs> and we appreciate all the good work and time that they do from that end. Rocco, I think you were just recently at Catawissa with the um, recreational, the ATV recreational area. Yes, um, I thought that was very well attended. Um, a lot of the participants brought their off-road vehicles up, although they, um, I did not take a tour with them. But um, very impressive. I think it's a good first step uh, for motorized recreation and hopefully we can go further. Okay. Thank you and thank you for, for joining the event. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention too in our afternoon session, Meredith has kind of been our spearhead, our leader in uh, putting together our drafts of the transition document for the next administration and we have a most recent draft available. I think it was circulated among the council members, but we will also be reviewing that and seeking your input in this afternoon's session as well. And last but not least, I would like to turn it over to Bob. He has been involved in two groups. One, a um, registration fee work group that he's been uh, asked to be a member of, and most recently he has joined, he was asked to join the Recreation Engagement Coalition, which is being spearheaded by Nathan Rigner that's looking at outdoor recreation, and I asked if he would just give us an update on those two things this morning. Bob? Thank you, Gerilyn. Uh, the uh, fee committee uh, activity is driven by the Snowmobile ATV Advisory Committee. And uh, it consists of 
two members of that committee from the snowmobile side, two from the ATV side. Um, PTAC, who uh, we'll hear from later this morning, uh, has uh, two representatives on it, one snowmobile and one ATV, and I make up the seventh member of the committee. We have had now, I've kind of lost count, seven to eight Zoom meetings on the topic, and it's proven to be much more complex, I think, than a lot of people uh, thought it would be, because we're not only talking about getting our uh, ATV and snowmobile fees up to date. By my recollection, the last fee increase was 1985. At least that's the last legislation I could find. So we're, we're quite far behind just the, in a matter of inflation. Um, and there's also a gas tax component to it, which is gasoline that goes into recreational vehicles that are not used on the highway. Uh, the restricted receipts account, which is where ATV and snowmobile fees currently go, uh, is, has a million dollar gas tax refund annually in it. But uh, most recent numbers from the Federal Highway Administration indicate that there's probably 11 to $12 million of this money available. And uh, the committee has taken on the task of considering how to use this money perhaps to be able to offset um, the individual registration fee increases. So at this point, uh, the snowmobile uh, side of the equation uh, is promising some numbers uh, by the end of September that hopefully will be actionable and we can come up with recommendations uh, based on those. And the ATV folks are hard at work trying to uh, coalesce their um, information. And uh, I think we're behind schedule. I think we hope to have this done, possibly reduce the legislative language, this legislative session. I don't believe that will happen. Uh, but at least the ball is rolling and I'd look forward to that uh, certainly shortly after the first of the year, if not before. So that was the uh, fee committee discussion. The Outdoor uh, Recreation Engagement Coalition is, um, as Gerilyn said, uh, Nathan Rigner, who's uh, the outdoor director now in Pennsylvania, um, has put this together. There's more than 20 states that currently have these outdoor recreation offices now. And um, glad to see Pennsylvania jump on the bandwagon. My understanding is we're the sixth uh, largest recreation, I believe that's right, the sixth largest recreation uh, state in the union. So it's important, it's important to the state and it's important to the outdoor recreationalists. We had an icebreaker meeting on uh, September 14th at the governor's mansion. The uh, engagement, recreational engagement coalition members number, I, I think the goal was around 30, but I think there's about 45 or 46 of us now. And uh, we have a, a retreat upcoming uh, at Shavers Creek Environmental Center on October 12th and 13th. And hopefully this will go a long way to setting uh, a strategic agenda in Pennsylvania to um, boost outdoor recreation and, and engage everyone who wants to be part of the process uh, in the process. A lot of different disciplines are represented and um, it's quite enlightening to get together with folks who uh, you may not share any knowledge of their preferred type of recreation, but we certainly can find some common ground and uh, I think work from there. So that is the Recreational Engagement Coalition and uh, myself and uh, Silas Chamberlain, also a CONRAC member, are uh, representatives on the, this coalition. So that's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anybody have any questions for Bob at this point? Okay, well, thanks. Thanks again for that update. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Gretchen, who is going to provide our department report. Good morning again, everybody. Um, you know, lots to report on. We have had a busy two months since uh, we have met last, and, and you see, obviously, uh, Cindy's empty chair there. She regrets not being with you for the second month in a row, um, but she is uh, at the state, new state park announcement today, and I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about those uh, a little bit later, so I won't provide details right now on those. But I did want to update you, kind of going chronologically uh, back from when we last met on some of the things that have happened, which are pretty exciting for the Commonwealth and for, uh, for DCNR. 
Uh, so you heard Rocco talk a little bit about Catawissa. So Catawissa is a new motorized recreation area uh, that is going to be part of Wiser State Forest. This is the first in the system, uh, and it was uh, um, it, we were able to do this thanks to the governor's budget uh, passed the uh, um, most recent budget. It was passed. It's in Schuylkill and Luzerne counties, uh, and it is um, designed to be an off-highway park. Uh, it, it, it was the previous site of Paragon Adventure Park. For those of you in that area may be uh, familiar with that, that was closed about 10 years ago. Um, but in addition to providing motorized recreation, it also allows us to do a number of conservation uh, goals as well, which is protecting some of the water quality issues that are uh, um, restoring some of the degraded mine lands that were there, uh, conserving some of those ecological resources that are found in that area. And also educating visitors on, on you know, what is this uh, motorized recreation, what are these former abandoned mine lands and, and restoration efforts. Uh, so it has um, contiguous, contiguous tracts of forest lands with sensitive plant habitats, high quality tributaries of the Catawissa Creek, old growth forest. So there's, there's a number of uh, ecological uh, elements to that motorized park that's uh, going to add to the value of that acquisition. Uh, and speaking of ATVs, uh, this past weekend was the uh, last weekend for the pilot project that uh, is uh, the season has ended for that pilot project and this was really the first full season of uh, that um, project you are all familiar with uh, up in the north central uh, Pennsylvania. We sold about 3,600 permits uh, which is about double what we did last year uh, and uh, you know overall the, the reports back from the uh, both the locals and the forest district folks, or is that it's, it's, it's relatively quiet, um, meaning that there hasn't been a whole lot of um, a whole lot of issues uh, with uh, noise and trespassing and so forth. Um, there have been a few complaints about because it was a dry summer about the dust issues. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing that we've been hearing. So we have worked with the townships to reimburse them for dust suppression um, uh, and then we're now obviously planning for 2023 uh, and what you know preferred changes and uh, how that route will, will change based on feedback. Uh, so we have been meeting with PennDOT and the township to get that feedback so we can make those adaptations uh, and um, so those things will all be wrapped up this fall uh, to, to obviously plan for the next season. So the big announcement that you probably all heard was that this was the largest grant announcement uh, uh, that we have made in recreation and parks uh, DC in our history. $90 million was announced at the beginning of September for 330 projects across Pennsylvania. Uh, and those are our regular community conservation uh, partnership program grants. Uh, and you know, that uh, historical investment is going to obviously help uh, many more communities make these investments. Um, just giving you a, a total for this administration to show you the magnitude of the impact that we have in communities, we've awarded more than $430 million in grants uh, for more than 2,300 projects across the Commonwealth. That's just over the last uh, seven years. Uh, so this was uh, you know, an unprecedented announcement. Uh, and um, also unprecedented is uh, because of some of the funding secured in the budget for the uh, ARPA funds, the federal funds, uh, uh, we are able to make a uh, new fall grant round announcement opening uh, for a short window period of time here for applicants uh, to um, apply for uh, grants that you know maybe they weren't able to apply for before because we're changing match requirements that might accommodate some of those municipalities with populations that are fewer than 5,000 people. Uh, so that grant match is coming down to 20% uh, with no cap on the project side. So that um, um, may allow some of those communities to access that grant funding where they might not have been able to in the past. So this is really a great opportunity for some of those smaller municipalities to apply for grants. So if you know of any uh, in your area that have always struggled with that match requirement of DCNR grants, uh, uh, please let them know about that um, opening or that possibility. Um, so infrastructure, you all know that we got 
uh, $75 million in ARPA funds to uh, rehabilitate park and forest uh, infrastructure. Uh, and we, uh, Cindy and John and others, uh, hit the road uh, early on after that announcement to make some of the demonstration uh, project announcements that would show how that money is being spent. We were at Yellow Creek and Seven Tubs, and I think, uh, Bob, you were at Yellow Creek, so you saw that announcement and saw how that money will chip away uh, uh, a little bit at the backlog of infrastructure projects um, in our parks and forests. We'll continue to do some of those infrastructure events uh, to raise the awareness on the importance of keeping these facilities um, ready and open and safe. We made a great announcement last week, which I think is getting good publicity, uh, which is the um, intent for DCNR to purchase 100% of its electricity from re renewable sources by uh, 2030. Uh, so that uh, will be kind of split between our own generation of, uh, from green energy um, and purchasing uh, green energy. So I think it's a, maybe about a 50-50 split. Uh, so we, uh, as you know, we are um, able to, to do this as a, as a demonstration to others of, about how um, we should be a leader in renewable energy because we have these facilities. Um, so, and we can also message about that uh, to the 42 million visitors that come to our state parks and forests. Uh, so that got a really positive editorial today in the Scranton Times about how uh, DCNR is leading the way. So I'll share that editorial with you all, but it, it really is um, uh, a testament to our leadership in, in conservation. Um, we currently have about 23 solar installation projects um, on our land with about 18 in progress uh, under construction. Uh, and uh, and you, you know about our high performance buildings. We've talked to you about our green, green buildings uh, throughout the system. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great example of how state, state government, state agencies can be a leader uh, for the Commonwealth and for the citizens of the Commonwealth. You heard a little bit from Bob about the kickoff of the Recreation Engagement Coalition. This is a big deal for Pennsylvania. It's getting national attention. Uh, we've had conversations with national leaders uh, in the recreation sector who are applauding Pennsylvania's efforts to, uh, to really elevate uh, the importance of outdoor recreation uh, for the Commonwealth, for its quality of life, for its economic vitality, and for the, for the growth of our small and rural communities. So, uh, thanks to Bob and Silas for being a part of that. Uh, the goal is over the next eight months or so that that coalition will come up with a set of recommendations that will uh, uh, really guide this office that we have uh, to help uh, knit together uh, the very diverse uh, sector that's out there that represents uh, uh, recreation. Uh, well, foliage, you know, that kicked off. I don't have to go um, into that, but we have experts all throughout the state telling you how, how great your forests are going to look, and we do weekly reports, uh, so you, you may, may see some of that uh, hitting, the, um, hitting the airwaves. Uh, next week is the first ever Pennsylvania Green, uh, Sustainability Summit uh, that's being held virtually. I would encourage you all to share that link that I had sent out last week, I believe. Um, that's really important for municipalities, local governments to, uh, it's free to listen in on some of the experts that have really taken a step down this path, uh, you know, telling them how to access grants, uh, how to, um, you know, how to uh, you know, incorporate green and sustainable practices into their government. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you to spread that far and wide to your local elected leaders. So that is a, um, a really a great listen-in session. You don't have to go anywhere, search your computer, and you can hear those full day of speakers, followed by Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I believe, are, are webinars during lunch. So all day Monday and then uh, the rest of the week. Uh, and then finally, I know I'm talking long. Sorry about that, because uh, uh, Nicole has to get on here quickly. She has to be off by 11. Um, uh, Sunday, if it doesn't rain, head out to um, Walk in Penn's Woods, being sponsored by the Bureau of Forestry and others. Uh, one day concentrated on lead uh, walks within our forest system and park system as well as participating and I'm sure some local municipalities and, uh, uh, you know, guided hikes to where you're going to hear from your foresters and, and uh, it's really a neat, a neat thing that they do and the service they provide. So I encourage you to look on uh, DCNR's uh, website and their calendar of events and just look for October 2nd and you'll see a list. I think there's a couple dozen hikes throughout the Commonwealth. So. 
Um, I'm going to stop talking. Sorry, that was long, but it was probably shorter. Than the <laughs> 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 Thank you. Microphone on. Thank you, Gretchen. Does anyone have any questions for Gretchen at this time? Bob? Gretchen, I just wonder quickly, I know there was a, uh, a court case filed by the Pennsylvania Environmental Defense Foundation on, um, I think it had to do with uh, the letting of grants related to uh, trail development from Renova down towards the Williamsport area. And I know there was a Commonwealth uh, court hearing on it a couple weeks ago. I wondered if there's anything you could share um, I will have to get back with you on that, Bob. I don't have anything to share at the moment. Um, our chief counsel is out this um, week for Rosh Hashanah. Um, but I'm, Tom, you know anything else about that? Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Come on up and turn a mic on, and if you have anything about, I know particularly about the grant, um, you would know about. Yeah, so just real quickly, and I'm no legal beagle expert, um, but, but anyways, there was a stay that was put in place because of the court proceedings. The stay meant that we couldn't advance. There was actually three grants that we sat on for a while, but there was a court hearing. Um, the court basically ruled in favor of the department's petition, which was, hey, you know, this doesn't make sense. It's not on state land, and, um, you know, we shouldn't be holding these grants because the grants actually are on private land. They're not on state land. And the case that is being filed addresses development of the ATV connector on state land. So it was it was lifted, and we're advancing the grant projects um, just like we would any other time. Are there any other questions, Meredith? Gretchen, what percentage of DCNR's electricity is already renewable? Based? How close are we to 100 is what I'm wondering. So by 2030, we expect to, we expect to use 28.7 gigawatts of electricity with us producing about 15 gigawatts of that and purchasing 13. So we're gonna be maybe 60, 40, you know. So, so we're not, so by, what I don't know right now is what percentage we produce from, from clean, from renewable source. Okay. That I can get that for you. But that's the plan by 2030 is to actually produce ourselves with our solar arrays um, the 28, um, I'm sorry, 15 gigawatt hours of that 28 okay. gigawatt hours. Yeah. The other quick question I had, where can people find more information about the ARPA funds issue you mentioned an additional DCNR grant. I may have misunderstood what you meant, but is there is there additional opportunity there? Yes, for, for Tom's, uh, uh, and, and he can, why don't you just touch on that when you give your presentation, but they okay. have um, stuff on their website. They're going to be having webinars uh, coming up in the near future that people can listen into uh, to learn more about that supplemental uh, okay. grant round for this fall. Great. Thank you. Matt, did you have a question? I, I do. I, I wanted to, um, I actually have two things I want to mention. I'll, I'll segue right off of the, the previous question. Um, as it relates to the, the solar discussion, I think it's important to, to throw out there and, and something that I have appreciated uh, uh, in, in conversations with DCNR is um, that, that there is a nuanced approach that needs to be taken to solar. And I know from conversations with Nicole, the policy director, that DCNR is, um, is, is approaching that with the appropriate nuance. And what I mean by that is it's great to talk about solar um, as clean energy, but of course solar presents a lot of land use questions that if managed improperly really creates other uh, negative consequences. Um, and you know, one of the things that as I pulled up the one news article there, I didn't love the uh, picture, the, the file photo that was presented there that was just a huge solar array across a field. Um, would that field be better as a forest? Um, you know, interesting questions there. But DCNR, uh, through some of the discussions that, that we have had uh, related to um, uh, just some guidance documents and some, some, uh, some discussions, um, it is important to remind folks that 
um, that there's a right way and wrong way to install solar. And, and, and those nuanced conversations are happening at DCNR. And I think that that is important. And I think as we go forward and we look at where it makes sense to do solar uh, installations, um, there's a lot of great ideas out there as far as, you know, elevated installations over parking lots, uh, roofs of buildings, things like that. But, uh, you know, certainly I think that uh, the conversation would be missing its appropriate nuance if it didn't also include the idea that there's a very questionable carbon calculation if you were to take a forest and turn it into a solar installation. And, and, and those conversations are happening here, and I think it's important to, to, to bring that out. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the second thing that, um, that, that I wanted to throw out there is thank you for bringing up the walk in Penn's Woods. Uh, there's a lot of partners that are supporting that. Um, uh, the Penn State Department of uh, Ecosystem Science and Management, the Center for Private Forests, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative Implementation Committee, Pennsylvania Forestry Association, a lot of partners that are all plugged in on that and DCNR. So uh, certainly that's something we'll be sharing to our members. And, and it's so important to have that conversation around all the different angles by which we connect with our forests and, and all the different angles by which they are uh, advantageous to the population generally. So thanks for bringing that out and we'll be sharing that as well. Great. Okay, any other questions for Gretchen? Okay, all right. Uh, just due to Nicole's time schedule, we're gonna hold on our council business and move to her presentation, which we've been discussing. So without further ado, Nicole, if you're there, we'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Geraldine. And um, um, sorry, um, sorry not to be able to be there with you guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Wonderful. So um, I just wanted to share some of the work that we've been doing and that uh, certainly uh, uh, provided a little bit of background. Uh, we've been working on uh, developing conservation considerations for siting and planning, maintaining grid scale solar systems in Pennsylvania. You know, this is work is really driven by a number of our policy priorities, uh, climate adaptation and mitigation for certainly, uh, we are, are seeing solar as an opportunity to advance our, the Commonwealth's climate goals, reduce our emissions, so certain utility scale solar is a huge component of that. Uh, but we also want to see responsible and sustainable siting principles implemented. Um, this comes from you know, our interests in sustainable forest management. Uh, sustainable forests certainly provide multiple benefits, uh, not just um, supporting the forest product industry and, and, and the jobs and, and, and the local economies, uh, but also water quality, air quality, uh, flood management, uh, flood mitigation, and also, of course, carbon sequestration. So we're working actively to expand our forest canopy here in Pennsylvania, uh, and we see opportunities through conservation, through forest buffers, through, through tree plantings. Um, and of course, we care about resource protection and habitat and connectivity. So all of these are, are um, incorporated into how we approach uh, our guidance in regards to uh, utility scale solar. I'll note that utility scale solar doesn't happen on DCNR lands. Uh, so this is really intended for um, providing some uh, to help make informed decisions from a landowner perspective, from a municipal official perspective, and hopefully from an investor and a developer perspective as well. Uh, so DCNR doesn't have a regulatory role in, in, this, in this process. Um, what we do is we bring planning tools to the table. You're probably familiar, for example, with the Pennsylvania Conservation Explorer, which provides conservation information that can help uh, project managers on the ground identify potential impacts to threatened or endangered species. We have a number of data and analysis tools through uh, Bureau of Forestry, for example. We've done some really great work with Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Nature Conservancy uh, in regards to climate analyses, uh, looking at you know, conservation priorities from a connectivity perspective, from a habitat perspective, uh, from a resource perspective. Uh, our Bureau of Geological Survey uh, can offer a number of, of um, tools and resources related to geology, hydrology, uh, subsidence, et cetera. Uh, and of course, we have our technical assistance, mainly through our uh, service foresters who work in, with individual landowners who are um, working to to uh, sustainably manage their their lands, um, combating issues like invasive species and, and all the issues that we are managing on our own lands. 
Uh, which brings me to this guidance, which we really felt was was important for DCNR to put some some good information out. Um, there is a lot of good resources out there. We built on that, we believe. Uh, so this is, you know, we, we were approached by some of our stakeholders asking for some of this. Uh, we also met with our stakeholders, as Matt mentioned, and, and um, you know, really tried to get a better understanding of what our stakeholders' needs and concerns are. Um, and so we're really, again, intending to, to uh, provide this as a, as a resource to help inform decision making um, and, and really hopefully overall um, guidance enriched with existing resources and tools that are already out there. So we are launching this resource on October 3rd in conjunction with the sustainability summit that Gretchen mentioned. I also encourage you to attend. I think it will be a, a really great learning opportunity. There will also be lunch uh, learning opportunities throughout the week as well. Uh, you will see a press release from DCNR, so look out for that. Uh, if you have any, if the CONRAC is a, as a whole, you've already provided some some um, comments on this, but if you have any additional comments in regards to this document, we will see this as kind of a a living document that we want to, to um, improve upon over the course of the next few years, so certainly reach out to me. Um, and provide additional resources. Um, and I will stop there. Um, I may be able to take a question or two, but you know, feel free to reach out individually once the resource is out there. I'm happy to have conversations uh, with you and thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Does anyone have any questions for Nicole at this time? Matt? I'll just say that the, uh, Nicole, I want to com uh, commend you and thank you. And, and my brain had drifted from the agenda and was on the, uh, the uh, prior report when I was uh, singing your praises. So I didn't even realize you were listening. So uh, I stand by everything I said and I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Well, I'm glad there's a recording of this, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Have a great, great meeting. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. At this point, let's go back up on our agenda to our legislative report. And I don't think Eric is here to go. Yeah. Come on, join us with a microphone today. With us, we have Nate Lutz, who will give an update on our legislative happenings. Yeah. I'll just mention a couple things. So uh, last week we were over at the Capitol. Uh, participated in a couple different hearings. Uh, our state geologist, Gail Blackmer, testified at a hearing hosted by Senator Yaw about um, carbon capture and storage as well as hydrogen in Pennsylvania. Um, and then Secretary Dunn and Deputy Secretary Norbeck participated in a roundtable hosted by Senator Yaw about plans for um, spending the clean streams funding that we received in this uh, most recent budget. So there were a lot of um, state and federal um, stakeholders there talking about plans to um, improve water quality with that funding. Um, and also last week, the Senate passed uh, House Bill 1823, which officially codifies the transfer of Washington Crossing uh, Historic Park to DCNR from PHMC. Um, we've been operating as a state park for the past few years, but um, this is kind of like the final piece that puts that officially into law. So we expect uh, the governor to sign that bill soon. And then uh, on October 6th, we have a few folks who will be speaking at a uh, Parks and Recreation Caucus meeting hosted by Senator Schwank. Um, Secretary Dunn is going to talk about the boost in funding we received in this budget and how we're gonna um, use that to improve state park and forest infrastructure and provide grants. And then Nathan Regner is going to be presenting about Pennsylvania's outdoor recreation economy. And uh, I think that's all we have. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Nathan? All right. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Okay. All right. And moving right along here up to council business. And there were two items just um, to share briefly. And one is at our last meeting in July, we had the presentation on the uh, concessionaires. And we as a council didn't have a chance to talk about that too much in our afternoon session, but um, we were thinking that part of that discussion, people were saying that they would like to have some type of follow-up letter, maybe encouraging them to move forward with 
doing kind of a self-examination of how they could improve and working with an outside consultant kind of take a look at ways to improve the program, the concessionaire program, seeking concessionaires and their policies and that type of thing. So I think in our afternoon session, we got a lot to do in our afternoon session, but we can um, talk more about that um, with Heather and Judy's presentation. And then the second thing will be following up with Barb's discussion today on Friends of the Loyal Sock Creek. Okay, with that, Gretchen, I'm going to turn it back over to you with our three new state parks. Yes, um, great news. And, Ari, you can advance the slides for me. I'll just kind of tell you when to advance the slides. Um, great news uh, for Pennsylvanians, for visitors to Pennsylvania, uh, was announced yesterday by Governor Wolf at one of the sites, which I'll get into in a minute. But this is the first time in several decades um, that uh, we've added this number of state parks to the system. Um, this was a, a great achievement accomplished through uh, the last budget, uh, and we are very pleased to be able to make this announcement. Today, Secretary Dunn is at um, the third one on the list there, and I'll get some descriptions of each of these. We would have liked to have had state parks here to describe these to you because they're a lot better uh, attuned to what these lands are and, and what took place to get uh, to where we are today, uh, but of course they're all out uh, celebrating at these uh, at these events. So, um, so with that, uh, Eric, go on to the next slide, and we'll we'll, we'll tick through these. So yesterday, uh, we announced uh, all of them, but the governor stood uh, at uh, on a farm field uh, in York County, um, uh, near Wrightsville, kind of overlooking the Susquehanna River of the addition of Susquehanna Riverland State Park. Next slide, Eric. And so this uh, is a wonderful new property, about 1,100 acres uh, that is, um, you know, being there was just so, so neat to see um, what resources is going to be for the people uh, in, in that area. Really um, adding to already conserved land by the Lancaster Conservancy, there's already about 1,000 acres down in that area. So this adding to that uh, really makes uh, a contiguous um, system of recreation and, and, and um, con conserved lands that will be enjoyed uh, for generations to come. There's multiple um, rock outcrop vistas. We walked out to the most spectacular one, which has panoramic views over the Susquehanna River. Um, there's nearly a mile of the Susquehanna Riverfront, uh, uh, 1.5 miles of Cadoris Creek. Uh, so we're going to be developing recreational access uh, to the river. Uh, to the creek, fishing, boating access will be important for this important resource for this park, um, but also overnight. Uh, so that will be an important addition uh, to this park, um, overnight uh, features, overnight accommodations with um, campgrounds and uh, walled units like cabins and, and, and so forth. So um, really exciting uh, addition here uh, along the Susquehanna, obviously important for the Chesapeake Bay watershed to protect these lands along the rivers and to conserve those uh, special uh, woodlands that protect uh, what's going into the river. Uh, so next slide might show you some, yes, yeah, it, it means, I'm, I'm not a map person, but you can see the big shaded green area uh, is the, the, the uh, layout of the property. And of course, you can see the frontage uh, to the uh, creek and uh, the river itself. Next slide, Era. Uh, and those are the, the overlooks, uh, so when you come out to this outcropping, uh, you'll, that's what you'll see, uh, just spectacular. Uh, the governor was talking, or, or Phil Wanger was talking about um, seeing the sunset, um, you know, being able to see the sunset from on the, over the Susquehanna by a certain angle, which is kind of neat, I guess is not um, usually something that happens uh, in this area. So next slide. Uh, some more uh, vistas there, of course, the, the view of the bridge, and there's uh, Cadoris Creek. So, um, so really a lot of partners went into this. I mentioned the length of the Conservancy, but obviously uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's Bureau worked tirelessly with the Conservancy and other partners to uh, protect these, these lands. And you know, it's just really, it's really neat to stand there and say, you know, this is going to be around for a long time and you know and I guess that's what people said you know 50 hundred years ago when they were protecting uh, parks that came before us so uh, very very exciting to be adding uh, parks to the system 
Uh, next slide, Era, uh, which brings us to where the Secretary and other state parks officials are today. Um, and this is uh, Big Elk Creek. Uh, and I have not been to Big Elk Creek, so I'm going to be looking at my notes for this. Um, this is the, la the largest acquisition, which is 1,700 acres plus. Um, and it's 13, uh, 3.5 miles of the Big Elk Creek, which is a, a tributary to the Elk River, which goes directly into the Chesapeake Bay. I guess it's the, the easternmost part of the watershed before you get to the Delaware uh, watershed. And uh, Big Elk Creek um, is um, uh, significant in, the, in a lot of ways. Not only does it offer a lot of protection for the natural resources there, it has 190 acres of floodplain, 600 acres of woodlands, 100 acres of native grasses, 800 acres of farmland, many miles of hiking trails. Uh, uh, there, there have actually been over 690 separate plant species have been identified in this park, 15 of which are considered endangered or rare in the Commonwealth. Um, so it's, it's part of, again, part of a larger system of protected lands, which is always important when you're protecting the landscape. Um, this uh, is part of nearly 8,000 acres of conserved public space, which joins up with, um, how about going to the next slide and see if we have that schematic. We kind of see where that is in, in reference to the Mason-Dixon line, so it butts up against uh, 5,300 acres of a natural area preserved in Maryland and other conserved lands in Chester County. So this makes one of the most significant continuous public green spaces in the uh, so just adding that acreage together um, is really a good protection uh, for the natural resources that are found on those lands, but also the recreational resources. And so one of the reasons why we're adding these state parks, particularly in the eastern part of the state, is that we face tremendous amount of pressure in our eastern parks uh, from, you know, the eastern seaboard big cities. Uh, so you've got these people, millions and millions of people within short driving distances of the eastern part of Pennsylvania. And have overloaded our state parks. So being able to add to the system in the eastern part of the state really kind of takes some of those pressures off of our existing land and provides more uh, opportunities for recreational amenities. So this will feature overnight, which is big for this area. Um, there, are, there are not enough overnight spaces in the southeast, so this will add to campgrounds and roofs overnight, cabins and so forth, um, as well as the hiking trails and all the other uh, typical amenities that come with with the state park. And so uh, next slide, I might show you some pictures there. I mentioned the, the uh, open farm fields. Um, next slide, um, again, you'll see forested areas. Uh, next slide, um, it takes you to our next park, which is going to be announced or celebrated tomorrow, uh, and that is um, Vosburgh. Uh, so Vosburgh Neck is uh, 669 acres in Wyoming County. And it, too, uh, offers, you know, hiking and tremendous vistas, uh, but it provides significant public access to the north branch of the Susquehanna River. So all three of these parks in the, in the Bay Watershed, which is, goes toward our goal of protecting uh, the watershed, uh, this will be a day-use park only, uh, and it will feature, you know, sort of that public access to the water as well as hiking trails. Uh, and uh, the cultural and historic resources that are protected there in that park. There's remnants of the Pennsylvania Canal, historic graveyards, um, uh, stone walls, uh, beautiful structures from the 1700s and 1800s. So uh, this is the first park to be developed, uh, first state park to be in Wyoming County. So they were very, very excited about this. Um, interestingly enough, the Susquehanna River is 444 miles, and this is 222. Uh, so this is halfway, and you can see where it gets its name, thanks, Sarah. Um, you can see where Vosburgh Neck gets its name, a very interesting, um, uh, significant, uh, you can spot it on a map from far away uh, about that curve in the Susquehanna River, and that is 222. So it's um, halfway on the, the Susquehanna River, um, and just like we have the halfway point at Pine Grove Furnace with the Appalachian Trail, uh, we, we have, we're going to have to have, celebrate the halfway point on those who are kayaking uh, the entire Susquehanna River. And by the way, I think Cindy Dunn was the first woman uh, to kayak, the, well, modern day woman. I don't know, you know whether there were people in history that kayaked it, but I think Cindy was the first woman to do the full 
444 uh, the Susquehanna River. Um, at least I'm giving her credit for that. Um, <laughs> she was one of the first to do it, if, if not the first. Um, so that, uh, it will be celebrated tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Janet's going to be able to join us up there uh, for that. Are you going to be there? There you go. Great. All right. So, so um, next slide, let's see if we have any uh, pretty pictures. So there you can see kind of that neck, uh, that panoramic um, of, of what that park looks like. Next slide. Um, you know, it's just it's going to be a beautiful space for people of Wyoming County. I know Senator Baker was extremely excited about this and has worked with us. Uh, for a while on getting that. Yeah, you can advance to the next slide. So what's the next step? Um, obviously, uh, we have to get these developed. They are open now for the public. We have hired the managers uh, and the staff uh, uh, to run these parks. So we're already getting ready, prepping for public use with initial signage and, and um, you know, stuff on our website to show people how to get there. Um, and then the, the master site planning begins. As you know, it's just, you just don't slap a state park together. It's an important public process that you try to figure out what are the needed amenities for this region, what holes need to be filled, recreational gaps need to be filled uh, by these state parks, um, what's something new that visitors are looking for. Uh, so that is a public process that uh, begins uh, dialogue. Um, obviously, we have to do all of the ecological uh, uh, site uh, investigations and, and um, determine what needs to be protected uh, and what history needs to be protected and interpreted, and then obviously building that infrastructure. Uh, and so we have the money to, to build that infrastructure, uh, and we've acquired the land and we've set aside some of the money to build some of that infrastructure. Um, and like I said, the staff has been hired. So uh, we have temporary names, as I just announced for these, uh, but those names could change based on the public process and what that unveils, um, but that at least gives people an idea of, of where we're heading for uh, these three new parks. Uh, any questions on this exciting news for DCNR and the citizens of the Commonwealth? Um, Gretchen, in particular towards the uh, Susquehanna River project, the first one, um, have you discussed with the uh, Fish Commission at all as far as ramps? Uh, enhancing some of the streams that lead through there, um, that would be a good partnership, I would think. Absolutely. I know Tom can probably shake his head over there. Um, Tim was supposed to be there yesterday, and he had, had another commitment where he couldn't, uh, okay, so he you couldn't guys make are on it. Board he with that he is going to be there tomorrow, I think, at the event. Um, but yes, they have been closely involved okay. and will be in the process because it is an excellent uh, fishing and boating resource uh, right. there. At, Creek and the River. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to say it's really exciting. I'm uh, excited to go to the one in Wyoming County. Uh, there was some significant farmland in, in the ones in the southeast. So is that going to be leased out, or is it going to be allowed to return back to its natural state? Or? I think um, the, the one, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about Chester County. I do know that the one is under current lease in um, uh, the Susquehanna, in the York County property. I don't know details on how long that lease lasts and, and what they will do with that. Um, Tom, do you, do you know? Probably not. Great. Thank you. Tom didn't know he'd get called into state park duty here, but he's been actively, <laughs> obviously, involved in these projects uh, with the conservation partners that have helped us acquire these lands. So he's familiar with them as well, and that's why I keep um, leaning over to, to fill in the gaps. Does anyone have any other questions for Gretchen? I, I just have one, Gretchen. How long has this been in the making, and maybe Tom too, but how long has this has it taken to get this to come to fruition 
these three, would you say? Well, I know that um, it's been years and years for some of these. The conversations go way, way, way back. Um, interest has been there for a while. Funding has not been there. I mean, that has been the, the key point. And so you, you get to a place in history where you have this funding, you have willing sellers, uh, you have the opportunity to do it, uh, and that, you know, it was just that, you know, that perfect opportunity to be able to act on uh, uh, on these significant lands that if lost, um, you know, they'd be gone forever. I mean, uh, yesterday the Lancaster uh, Conservancy president noted that, you know, there were, there were definitely interest in the subdividing and development, um, so houses among all, all the, that property there um, would, would have taken it, the recreation and conservation values out of that land. So, um, so it, 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 I would say probably some more than a decade, yeah. um, you yeah. know, probably even more than decades. So decades um, uh, were some of those um, yeah. interests why. Because I know yesterday, just hearing from some of the partners, there were discussions, like you said, well underway, and they just were so excited to have it finally come. And the only reason why I bring this up is because at the same time, you know, some people are also saying, well, we have an infrastructure issue, we have all these needs, and now you're getting parks, but it's almost like these opportunities have just, you know, presented themselves in a way that we're able to conserve and provide these opportunities for the people in these communities that have nothing or that are taxed with, like you were saying, especially in the Philadelphia area um, with, you know, so much use. So it's, you know, it is good to know that this has been able to, to come to fruition after so many years of work and, and discussion. Yeah, it was really bipartisan support. So um, uh, Representative uh, uh, Saylor was there, yeah. um, uh, the outgoing appropriations chair, and just was, you know, was instrumental in, in helping this so through, um, and um, so it's important to note that this is an issue that um, is supported by uh, by many, many people uh, who recognize that the long-term impact of something like this is significant. Great, important, yeah. Okay, all right, well, thanks so much. And now, at this point, we're gonna turn it over to Tom and give us an update on the TRAILS program. And Tom Ford is the Bureau Director of Recreation and Conservation. Thanks, Tom. Well, thanks for having me here today. And these state parks, uh, just getting off this subject, they are spectacular. The, the Riverlands is only one piece of what's been cobbled together over 25 plus years in the, in the lower Susquehanna. And it fits in really nicely. It's on the northwest edge of the, the conservation landscape. And it's knitting together like 6,000 acres of publicly protected land. It, it's got the trail going through it. Really cool stuff. If you have an opportunity, that's you should definitely visit them all. The the Vosburg Neck is geologically special in the Commonwealth, as you can see from the pictures. Really cool in its own right, and wonderful, wonderful paddling opportunities up there. I did that with my daughter years ago. And Strawbridge, which is the one down in Chester County, that's how I know it. That again, like Gretchen said, it was decades. Um, you know it. Discussion started, we put in like small infusions of grant funds, Chester County supported it, it got flipped to state parks. Long process, these things don't happen like that. I mean, it's, so it's pretty neat and the conservation partners across the board have been great to work with. Um, and I don't know, it's, I'm excited about it. Everybody should be really, really excited about it. And it'll be like once in a lifetime for me that, you know, three new state parks pop in. So it's, it's neat. And you know, real quick, just to add one thing, um, our former council member and bureau director of state parks, Bill Forey, was there yesterday as well. And I had a chance to talk to him, and he was he was thrilled with with being able to be there and that this was happening. So yeah. awesome. Um, so Trails Month, and we're going to talk about Trails Month in a second, and also what we're doing for Trails and the the, the Trails Advisory Committee. But to Meredith's question um, about the, the historic investment in the new grant round. So $90 million, we got it announced the earliest ever. September 6th is when we did the announcement. And at that same time, we announced a supplemental round that opened on the 6th and it closes on October 27th. If you hit the grant page or hit the DCNR's main page, click on the little grant button, it's gonna dump you onto our grant page. And there's, uh, you just navigate your way through it. 
and um, find the FAQ. There's an FAQ right on that landing page, the grants landing page, and it basically walks you through the whole the whole grant program for the fall. We stood that up, and you know, staff were absolutely awesome. I mean, the, it's crazy to get like a grant announcement out. Not nonetheless the historic size ninety million dollar grant announcement, but also to get permission to open up another grant round and get everything prepped for that. It was it was a monumental task, and um, you know we we got it done, which is awesome. Um, there's links to webinars on on that page as well, which which will walk you through the different kinds of grants and what uh, we're looking for there. So we had twenty five million dollars total. We actually spent I think it was eight million dollars with our grant announcement that we announced on September 6th. So we're down to like $16 million in ARPA funds, but there's also ARPA funds that uh, were directed to the Keystone Tree Fund for forestry, and those are gonna be administered as grants as well, and those can be used for riparian buffers and community tree planting. So it's a cobbled together grant round with a couple different funding sources, um, and it's gonna be interesting to see how it shakes out. Yep, and if you need any more info, I can certainly provide it. So with that, I guess let's talk about trails. And I apologize, I usually run this stuff, so I'm gonna be doing this and this. Um, so anyways, it's trails month and hopefully everybody here has had an opportunity to get out on some trails in the month of September. I know I certainly have. And my trail staff, uh, they would probably be here doing this presentation, but they're down at the East Coast or Eastern um, Pennsylvania Trails Conference right now. And uh, they're down there having fun, checking out trail stuff. I was with the secretary on Monday for a trail gap closing on the DNL trail, which is pretty exciting. It was extremely well attended and, and folks are happy about the progress that we're making down there on the DNL trail. And I'll have some pictures for you here in a couple minutes. Next slide. So Trails Month, it's a big thing for us. Um, you know, we de do a huge social media push. Um, we do events, we do walks, we, we do it all. I, okay, I apologize. So there's the stats on, on trail stuff, and it's, it's a great infographic. I'm not gonna read the stuff off, but you know the bottom line is Pennsylvania has lots and lots of trails, and it depends on what you like to do and, and where you live, but there's opportunities you know, for everybody um, to partake in the stuff that really excites them. Next slide. So we, as part of Trails Month, we do a, a Trail of the Year announcement. We did that earlier this month. Um, and it's the Delaware Canal Towpath was selected this year through a process where you know, the Trails Advisory Committee actually runs the process for selecting um, the Trail of the Year. And they selected this one this year and we did an event uh, with the Secretary earlier in the month. Next slide. The, I think it was just last week and I think Gretchen forwarded this to, to the committee. Um, we just released the, the annual report, which I think is really, really well done, and it describes all of the accomplishments um, of the trails program, and I would definitely check that out too. Just peruse it at your leisure, and it's available at that link, um, but again, if you if you go to uh, the DCNR and the grants page, you're going to be able to find the trail stuff. Okay, next one. The trail strategic plan really guides, um, you know, what we're doing in, re in relation to trails across the Commonwealth. And uh, again, another thing that the Trails Advisory Committee does, they help us with programmatic and policy stuff, including um, a lots and lots of help with uh, developing this plan for how we address trails and trail needs across the Commonwealth. Next slide. So the one recommendation, probably the most important one, and it's been a major focal point for us, is addressing priority trail gaps. And we want to have trails uh, within, um, you know, 10 minutes of every Pennsylvania. So when you look at that in the trail opportunities, and we've done lots of mapping, we've identified priority trail gaps. Next slide. So what's the priority trail gap? There's a definition on the next slide, if I remember this correctly, but visually, that's kind of a trail gap, right? You've got to get across the highway, you need a bridge or a tunnel, um, and we have lots of places where we need bridges or tunnels, um, and they're not cheap. So next slide. So here's the definition, um, and I'm not going to read through it, but it's basically shorter distances that need to be bridged. Um, there's lots of bridges, there are some tunnels, and um, 
but there's also sections, the, and there's going to be an event out in the Pittsburgh region in the not too distant future where there was an acquisition of about five acres, and we just announced this, of five acres or five miles of rail corridor and a bridge, which is absolutely critical to the Erie to Pittsburgh trail that we're trying to, to get from um, Pittsburgh up to Erie. Next slide. So this is the map of the priority trail gaps. When I first looked at this slide, I was like fixated on the red. Those aren't the gaps. Those, that's kind of the trail network across the Commonwealth. The yellow dots on this map are where the priority trail gaps are, and there's over 100 on there. Next slide. And, you know, so that gave you visually um, the mapping that we've been doing internally for quite some time, but we're also working with partners, including the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, on this trail manager tool. And this is a way for us to get a little bit more sophisticated and enable trail managers out there to basically identify their gaps and enter them right into, you know, the database and the GIS system that we're using um, in part to select these trail gaps. Next slide. So the uh, other thing um, that we've developed over the years, and we're going to get into some of these top 10 trail gaps here and have a little fun in a second. Um, but we have this um, story map, and it'll run you through the top 10 um, trail gaps. And the top 10 trail gaps, they're big, big issues. They're big projects. We're talking like 20, 20 million, 10 million, and it requires interagency coordination. And um, the infographic walk, walks you through a bunch of them. Next slide. Well, there's the definition. I should have remembered that that slide was there. So it's priority trail gap, you know, more than a million, and you know, definitely requires interagency coordination. We tap into PennDOT quite a bit for these trail gaps, um, and they, they've been really great partners. Next slide. Um, so what have we done? You know, so in 2018, um, we closed these two, one in western Pennsylvania, and the other one, a massive significant bridge across Lehigh River up in the community of Jim Thorpe, which was pretty awesome. I couldn't. I didn't think they could do it with a single span, but they, they managed to do it. It was, pretty, it was pretty cool to watch it come together like an erector set. Um, so next slide. Another one that we did in 2021 is at Canoe Creek State Park. I don't know this one as well as I know the others, but it connects the, the Lower Trail, and it gets the Lower Trail from south of Canoe Creek State Park into the state park. So there's a, a great terminus and opportunity for folks that are hiking or using the, the Lower Trail to get into the park and use the, the park's amenities. Next slide, please. And that one was a tunnel, obviously. The picture on the right was the tunnel. This one, um, Safe Harbor Trestle, three quarters of a mile long. Um, you know, this was a 10 plus million dollar project. And this is another one of these projects that th this has been talked about for 20 plus years. And, uh, you know, it finally came to fruition under this administration with, uh, you know, a lot of effort by a lot of people. Um, it was, it's the historic Enola low grade. So the low grade basically is called the low grade because it only falls like an inch over like hundreds of miles as it goes down towards Delaware, which is pretty phenomenal for you know, probably the technology that they were using back when they built this rail line. And it's a double bridge. There's still live rail lines on the bottom side, um, and they share abutments. But the top side is where the trail is, and it's way up there. Next slide. This is what it looked like before uh, construction. Um, the, the, uh, the trail actually just ended here for quite some time. Go ahead, next slide. And this is a picture after they took the ballast off on the right. You know, that was pretty much what was underneath it, and they had to do some steel work. There's a guy doing steel work there in the, the right corner there. And what they did is they basically um, put concrete, they concreted over, you know, the steel, so it's absolutely permanent. And in the next couple of slides, you'll see why that's important. Um, next one. So that's the, the grand opening. It was absolutely awesome. I mean, there's eagles flying around. There's all kinds of waterfowl in the river. And, um, you know, it, it was a beautiful day, but it was hot. Next one. So this one um, is a little bit of a story of, you know, accomplishment, woe, and now reaccomplishment. So uh, Marduk Forge Trestle in 2022, it's, it will be um, basically closed here shortly. Next. 
slide. This needed to be rebuilt. So the township basically went in and, and with their own force account labor and with their own resources, built this bridge, but they used, they used wood. So somebody that had a penchant for arson did that to the bridge. Um, you know, I, I think they caught them uh, at this point, but that was only word of mouth. Go ahead, next slide. So the, again, they're using concrete this time. So this is the bridge under construction, probably like within the last month. And it's nearing completion. And within the next month, um, I believe that there'll be another event down here to rededicate this. Next slide. And that's only a couple miles down the trail from the Safe Harbor Bridge. So it's an important connection and it's really unfortunate that it needed to be rebuilt. So this one's back out in, in uh, Western Pennsylvania. And, and again, uh, an important little link for the Erie Pittsburgh Trail. It's the Brady Tunnel. Um, you can see the, the wonderful winter picture on the left and you can see uh, like up in the upper left-hand corner there, the intrusion from water into the tunnel. It was in pretty bad shape needed to be stabilized, which we did. Next slide. And uh, the first step of this one in terms of closing this trail gap was to stabilize the tunnel so we didn't lose it. The uh, second step was to start collecting money to like stabilize it in a more meaningful way. So they're sleeving it. You can see the sleeves here on the right and it's gonna be sleeved all the way through. Next slide. This one, it's an interesting one. This is an urban one. It's down in Pittsburgh. Um, the borough of Etna, not, um, you know, not, a, not a rich area, not a, a rich borough, and it's along the, the riverfront, they're, so they're rich in the resources being along the river, but a community that had been forgotten for a while, I think it's safe to say. Um, but anyways, down here in this picture, there's, uh, you can see the railroad tracks. This was a gap because of the railroad tracks and the railroad crossing, and of course, Norfolk Southern, when you deal with them, it's always no, and it's always a problem. And, um, you know, through some legal research, we've realized that there actually was a legal right away. So this one got closed through legal action um, and basically just legal research, which is good. And you can see how nice the, you know, the, the riverfront piece of the trail is there, which is awesome. Okay, next slide. Um, we're getting towards the end of the, the dog and pony show here. The Northwest River Trail, um, that was completed this year. This one uh, is along the Susquehanna River and eventually it's going to connect to the Enola Low Grade Trail where those two other bridges were. So this is going to go all the way from Falmouth, um, Pennsylvania, down through in, into Columbia, which it actually does right now. Um, but between Columbia and where the Enola Low Grade start, there's, there's a gap there and it's a difficult one because it's really narrow. There's trains, there's, there's highway, and it's gonna be a tough one. But this one is spectacular, a great place to take a bike ride. Um, nice, flat, safe, and, and cool. Next one. So that's what, where it is. If you wanna stop along the way, stop in Marietta. Um, there's opportunities for food, ice cream, beer. It's all good. Next one. And Schuylkill River Trail, this one was a, a, a road crossing, important, um, and you can see the work that needed to be done there to get the thing elevated. So again, not a cheap one. Next one. So this one's coming up. Um, this is the Kiski Railroad and Bridge. This is the one where there's going to be an event um, maybe towards mid-October. And uh, this bridge was secured as well as I think it's five miles. Of, of trail and again it's it's important it was abandoned and this one again I mean this is always a story of, of time and this one was on the table before it fell to pieces and, and now it was back and it, it finally happened um, construction work at some point in the future um, I don't know when next one so again the 90 million that we just put on uh, the table um, and 15 million of it went to trails um, a good bit of the ARPA that we spent in the last grant round actually went to trail work. Um, those were good projects to put good chunks of money and, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were moving the ARPA money, you know, as quickly as we could. The supplemental round, I already talked about, it closes on October 27th. And then we have our, our normal grant round, which opens in, grant, in January. So there's no rest for the weary here. We're just like banging them out and, and putting money on the street, which is great. That's what we're here to do. And that's, that's what we're doing. And I think on Friday, the, the semi-annual grant round for snow and ATVs, that's the restricted account funds that Bob talked about. 
that supplemental round closes. So we got to review those applications, make selections in the midst of all this supplemental round. <laughs> so we're having fun. Next slide. Um, this is the typical annual funding, and this last round like basically blew this to pieces. Um, but this is typically what we have and what we can dedicate to to trails. And with the ARPA money right now, I mean, we're going to do some additional trail projects. I'm quite confident in the supplemental round. And next slide. And um, there was a question, I think somebody on, on council requested some information on maintenance and um, what we can do to support maintenance. So within some of our enabling legislation, um, actually almost all of it, maintenance is not permitted. But the difference between maintenance and rehabilitation sometimes is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, that's, that's where we can put money on, on the table so we can do rehabilitation. Um, I'm gonna end with that. The Trails Advisory Committee, for uh, just to provide just a, a rough overview of that, it's a 20 member committee and it's appointed by the, you know, by the agency. Uh, folks serve a period of time, I think it's a couple years, four years, something like that. And we t currently have two open slots. So if anybody's interested in, in filling one of those slots, there's two open slots right now. And again, I told you earlier that they help with policy and planning stuff. Uh, an, an example of some of the policy stuff that they really helped with is they helped Nicole as she wrestled with the e-bike policy recently, um, which was, that, that was a toughie. Um, but we did get that done and they helped quite a bit. And the, the other big thing that they do for us is that they provide input on our grant applications, which is required for the use of our federal funds, those Pennsylvania Recreational Trail Funds. Um, we're required by the federal enabling legislation to get input and they, they provide that input. So with that, that's all I got. Hopefully I didn't take too much time. That was great, thank you. Let's open it up. Anyone have some questions for Tom? Rocco? Tom, um, very good presentation. My question, when on one of the first slides, you had thousands of miles of trails for hiking, et cetera. But I notice on the motorized recreation, there's 906. Are there, you know, with the lead-in that we had, and I want to say Karamissa, am I pronouncing that right? Katarissa trail system, that was a great for, first step. Are there additional plans to bring up more mechanized um, trails, particularly uh, perhaps connecting? Yeah. Yeah, so I can address that. Um, you know, obviously the connector um, up in north central Pennsylvania is going to be important because it's going to connect those two, like on forest land, you know, motorized recreation areas. So that's going to provide, and I think that the miles that are on that are the miles strictly on forest land. So it's not counting the miles of motorized trails like at Rock Run, the, the outdoor park there, or the anthracite outdoor recreation area up in Schuylkill and uh, Northumberland County. So there's significant miles of trails there. I don't think they were accounted for in that 900. On the Catawissa, I mean, it's unbelievable. That's like 8,000 acres or 5,000 acres. It's gigantic, and it's, it's, it's a place to see in its own right for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and there's the opportunity, believe it or not, to connect the Anthracite Outdoor Adventure Area with, you know, the former Paragon property that we're calling Catawissa, which is going to be absolutely awesome. I think that'll get done. It's going to be a multi, multi-year but there's not that many landowners in between. And then you're talking about a complex that's I had 15,000 acres, humongous, gigantic, um, rival anything on the East Coast. Um, and I think in the future, you know, that's gonna come into focus and, and you know, provide a wonderful opportunity for folks. Bob? Tom, I was really interested in your comment about what happened in Aetna and the illegal right away. I don't know, I'm on a rail trail board up between uh, Cameron and Elk County, rail bank system, and uh, unfortunately we don't have the trail into St. Mary's yet, as Meredith will attest to. Uh, the the hang-up seems to be with the railroads, obviously, it's hard to get them to respond at all, and uh, most rail trail groups don't have the uh, 
financial ability to hire an attorney to, uh, you know, work on those things. Is there any – I'm interested in that. Was, was that legal work done by DCNR staff or outside attorney or – no, and I don't even know that we put any money on the table to support it. Um, uh, there was a grant to the borough. They knew they had an issue. They weren't going to be able to advance because they didn't have the, the all clear for that right away. Mm-hmm. So Pennsylvania Environmental Council, who's like really, really interested in, in active in trail development work, as you well know, they basically came in and said, we'll, we'll just, we need to take a look at this. We'll do it. I believe that's what happened. Um, and they, they pulled the deeds. They did the legal research, and they're like, Presented to Norfolk Southern and, and told them like, hey, you got you don't have a leg to stand on, because they were obviously they were asking they don't want anybody crossing their tracks anywhere at any time, and you know they're saying like, oh, just go ahead and do a two million dollar flyover, and meanwhile the legal right away was there. Oh, yeah, I mean I, I think that's the biggest. I think there's a multitude of opportunities for rail trails and rail banking in Pennsylvania, but the hang up is being able to force or get a response from the railroad or having a pool of legal expertise or money to make that happen. Of course, you know, PEC, I'm a motorized guy. The PEC is mostly or all uh, non-motorized trails or, or, or their interest, and that's fine. I just uh, I wish there was a way we could maybe Conrad, uh could brainstorm this and see if, see if there's a way to uh, – address that issue so that uh, the corridors are there, and I think they're the fastest means of development if we could only get a response from our yeah. friends at the railroad. So I think for the trail planning and feasibility study work that we do, I think we can provide money for, like, the deed research and the, you know, the legal research. We're not going to be able to help with litigating stuff, mm-hmm. um, but I know on the front end when you're doing the planning and looking at the feasibility of getting from here to there, I, we can help there. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yep. Any other questions for Meredith? Just a quick one. Thank you for your presentation. Mm-hmm. What is the, can you expand on the issue with maintenance and the enabling legislation and the limitation regarding maintenance? Yeah, so let's talk about the, the Keystone legislation passed in 1993. It provides funding to the agency for infrastructure funding um, as well as grant funding. Um, and within that, legislation they wanted investments to be more related to infrastructure acquisition and, and planning and maintenance um, it's it's huge the the need for maintenance is absolutely huge but we would be spending lots of money to support lots of staff and lots of communities in our program um, you know that were getting maintenance grants um, so that was specifically excluded from the legislation for those reasons and and it's more they wanted tangible projects that were going to result in something bricks and mortar, not spending time on, um, you know, the folks that are out mowing grass and, and uh, you know, picking up litter. Dave? Since you mentioned e-bikes, is there any update on where we are with the process of getting those? Uh, I replaced? don't know. I can have um, Nicole uh, check in with um, all of you, but the e-bike policy has been, all the public comments have been uh, read and um, a comment response document has been developed. I think she got close to 700 uh, comments that she, At all? <laughs> that's all. Uh, she put in categories and, and then that comment uh, response document will be shared, I would say, with, probably within the next month. Um, she anticipates maybe, um, a few change clarifications to the policy, but not significant changes to the way the policy uh, has been written. So once that uh, document is finalized internally, we'll share that. Okay, great. I, on you know a couple social media things, and we all you have to do is mention trails and e-bikes, and you all you know all of a sudden there's 500 comments from somebody. So it's important to a lot of people. As I was just wondering. Any other questions? I have a couple for you, but any other questions for Tom? I, I just have one, a couple. Um, with the other 90 trails or whatever, you're working on the, you know, you've got the big 10, the gap. How, what, how do you proceed with, with those? Is there any, um, in addressing any of their needs, how, how do you tackle those 90? 
So, I mean, the, the top 10 get a lot of attention. And again, they, they take time. Um, and we have to go over and twist PennDOT's arm to put like $10 million on the table when we're putting $1 million on the table. And that happens, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. They do have the ability to do that. We also work with DCED. Um, and pretty much any trail organization that, that has trail work to be done, I mean, they should apply. Um, you know, anybody who has any trail work that needs to be done should apply. And then, you know, priority is given to the priority trail gaps, um, you know, so there's a little bit of a process there. Mm -hmm. But we are happy to help anybody with anything, um, you know, until the money runs out. Mm -hmm. um, so are we, we don't have them lined up in a queue. If you were looking, for something along those lines, they're not lined up in a, in a queue like, oh, you're number one, you're number two. They're not. Um, they come in, and based on how far along and how ready to go they are, um, we they get grabbed. Okay. But there is some criteria, again, at looking oh, at yeah. gaps in those connections and that type of thing as well, yep. which is great. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, too, like from Comrac's standpoint, I know we were trying to enter into a discussion with the Trails Advisory Committee to see if we would want to form possibly a subcommittee to help address some of these issues that are out there, just to bring the minds together, not that we're going to solve them all, but at least maybe be able to identify resources or some solutions for some of the things, maintenance being one of them. Um, and so I was just wondering if there's anything that you could see that would be helpful from that end from where you sit with, with the advisory committee. I think that's a good conversation to have. And, okay. and I think what I would suggest is, is coming to the next PTAC meeting, which I don't know when it is, and, and basically putting it on the table and seeing, you know, how it resonates with them and what the needs would be. Um, I think this committee has maybe a bigger voice, and I think it can help elevate some of um, the stuff that they're working on, some of which is difficult stuff. Yeah. And I think they can support the the bigger, higher level work of, of you know, this committee. So I think that's, that would be great discourse to have with them. Conversation. Yeah. And, you know, just like some of the things that CONRAC has done to just try to bring people around the table around the conversation is CONRAC conversation. So we had two of them on outdoor recreation. We had one that uh, Joanne Kilgower did for us, an excellent job on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I could just see, like, maybe there's something around trails or a maintenance topic that we just get some of the key players out there mm -hmm. in a way to share information for these smaller groups that are in these communities that could benefit from knowing these resources are out there or something like that. So, so it might be good to, to follow up with you guys at that point. Super. And thank you so much for presenting today. We appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you guys for the opportunity to, to pop in and say hello and, and provide can I just make one comment? Sure. Um, through, you know, Tom's presentation and our previous discussion about the state parks is that, you know, you see DCNR is really in the long game, you know, and, and a lot of these projects take decades and decades and decades, and, and especially the examples with rail trails and, and closing those gaps, and it's really all about partnerships and relationships that we have formed in these communities and our landscapes. Um, or what make these eventually happen and the steadfast dedication of employees uh, who are working DCNR on these projects to make sure they come through it to fruition. So it really is, like Cindy said, she's quoted somebody else, but we're in the forever business. So when you're in the forever business, you've got to stick with it uh, so you can you know, reap those benefits for forever. Good comment, I agree. Okay. All right. Well, with that, let's keep moving. I've got 10 minutes to get this all done. And Dave's watching his watch over there. I know. <laughs> he can see it and the food's been brought in. Um, so, <laughs> so you can watch the clock. So at this point, we'll just do a quick round with our work groups. If there's any updates, we have done a lot and we've kind of been in a little bit of a hiatus with some, but um, how about if we turn and, and do that? Bob, do you want to start with Motorize? I plead hiatus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. And Meredith, is there any update from your end? We're going to, I mean, obviously we've got the transition document and some other. Nope. Nope. Okay. Again, we've been looking at forestry and working with them as well. So 
Communication and Outreach, Sarah? I've been on a little bit of a hiatus too. Um, I always like to do a plug for the newsletter. If anybody uh, attending virtually is not on the newsletter list, uh, you can sign up on the website. Um, and thank you to Katrina for all your work on the annual report and uh, putting together those newsletters and, and the outreach. Yeah, it's great. Wow. Very good. Great. So, yes, yeah, it's, been, it's yeah. been a great resource uh, for the council, and we'll continue it. So please join us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Sarah. And Joanne, I don't know if you're still with us or not. Is there anything by way of DEI that you'd like to share at this point? I think I think she has flipped off, um, and that that's been you know Emily has left her position, so we're kind of in. Um, but the next gen council is formed and and moving forward, so we'll continue from that end. And infrastructure, we're on a little bit of a hiatus as well. Just there was so many wonderful things that happened this budget round, um, but we do continue to have our monthly talks with Marcy from Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation, and she's going great guns ahead. We are, um, you know, continuing to see what can be a source of continuous funds to help with, you know, infrastructure on a, on a yearly basis. We're looking at like 100 million needed. So that is still a big nut to crack that we're going to be, you know, targeting for the ongoing and new administration as well. So, all right, that's our work groups. I don't know if we have any public comment. Anyone, Katrina or anyone, anything for, nope. I know Jim Laird stuck a question in the Q&A. Um, uh, Jim, did you want to offer public comment? It wouldn't be a discussion on this, but did you want to um, at least read that question? Eric, can you unmute, Jim? Hello, hi, this is Jim Laird. I don't know if he can hear me. Can you hear me, Nicole? Yes, or, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, the, just across the boards, I know Bob and others are very uh, well aware of this, but across the boards, all types of trails, whether it's non-motorized or motorized, we desperately need to revisit ROWA, uh, the Rural Use, or I'm sorry, the Recreational Use of Land and Water Act. Um, we, we are struggling to get easements from private property owners for hiking trails, equestrian trails, motorized trails, uh, trails of any type, we desperately need to revisit uh, ROLWA to, for the first time ever, get those amendments back in there that would protect private property owners, not only indemnify them when they provide public trail easements, but for the first time, really either reimburse them for their legal fees, or as the amendments that were once, uh, or more recently pr uh, proposed, get the, the uh, plaintiff, you know, get the person that's filing the claim uh, to be on the hook for the legal fees to cover the uh, property owner. Uh, we could get hundreds and thousands of easements if we could simply cover their legal fees when they're, if and when, or at least promise them that we will reimburse them for their legal fees when they have to go defend themselves in claims that 99% 99% of the time are faulty claims by a plaintiff that's either a gold digger or is at fault of their own. But if, if we could reimburse the prop, private property owner for their legal fees defending themselves, and the plaintiff knows that they're on the hook for that, we would see uh, legal cases drop tremendously, probably near to zero. Uh, we have to revisit that. I just put that out there to request that we get this back on the um, the docket uh, for ROLWA reform as soon as possible. And can you just tell me what that stands for? I'm not familiar with it. The okay. This is this is the number one tool. There's two tools that we have in Pennsylvania to indemnify private property owners. One is called ROLWA, which is the Recreational Use of Land and Water Act, R-U-L-W-A. Okay. And then yeah. the other is the, the Ski Act. Um, the Ski Act is very similar and probably even more effective, but in both cases, these are indemnifications that the state has offered to, to property owners um, 
to encourage them to provide public trail easements, but also indemnify them in the case of fraudulent uh, court claims. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. I just couldn't hear you when you were saying it. So, Rula, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank All you. All right. Any other questions or comments for Jim or anything else, Matt? If it would be appropriate to speak to that. Um, yeah, I um, uh, com completely agree with uh, w with the comment. And just to, to clarify for, for context for everybody, the uh, Recreational Use of Land and Waters Act does a great job of protecting landowners who allow people not for profit onto their lands through the kindness of their hearts. Um, the problem that comes up is, is that uh, RULA, or the Recreational Use of Land and Waters Act, is a defense that can be offered in court, um, but you still have to hire an attorney and get to court to be able to offer that. And so when RULA works, then the outcome of said court case would be, so let's say somebody comes onto your trail, steps in a rabbit hole, twists their ankle, and they want to sue you for it. Uh, RULA says no, uh, you know, you, but you've got to go to court, hire an attorney, and, and defend yourself and argue RULA, and then in which case you're not going to be paying any damages, but you've still paid an attorney. So I think it is a reasonable request to say somebody who is undertaking a, uh, uh, you know, an effort that is going to expand public access should be protected from having to pay out of pocket legal fees just to defend themselves against something that shouldn't have been their, their liability anyway. So uh, great, great comment. Uh, it's something that I've uh, always believed in, and, and I'm glad it, it came up here today. And certainly it would be a huge tool to expand public access in the Commonwealth uh, to enable partnerships with landowners and to give those private landowners a, uh, uh, a confidence that they're not subjecting themselves to a liability that would cause them to pay out of pocket. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for Senator. your comment. Yep, thanks, Matt. Okay. I think that we've covered everything. Um, and our next meeting is November 16th here at the Rachel Carson State Office Building. And with that, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Thank you. A second is Matt. All right. Anyone opposed? I don't think so. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also for our virtual uh, members joining today and audience members. We greatly appreciate it and have a nice day.